Hey Queen, it's Alex Batdorf and you're watching Get Shit Done, the YouTube series moving female entrepreneurs from inspiration to activation by showing you how to grow your company in a meaningful way by learning from other badass babes who have already done it. Have you had that moment where you're reading about all these companies that are fundraising, typically started by white men, and they're receiving a million, five million, ten million, a hundred million, and you're thinking, WTF? where they do that at. You see, a little secret about fundraising is that it's a lot less about what you know and a lot more about who you know. And as you know, only 2% of female founders receive venture capital. You're gonna learn how to raise money for your company when you don't have access to money bags in your network. Stay tuned because my guest today is gonna get your life. Rachel Rinock is a former advertising creative who quit her job at 25 to launch Weethos, the first freelance marketplace connecting highly skilled professionals with more meaningful work. Since the launch in 2016, she's been featured in Forbes and TechCrunch for raising $1.1 million in VC funding, landed on the cover of the New York Times for breaking the silence on a culture of sexual harassment, and was featured at Political's Women Rules Summit to frankly discuss sexism and sexual harassment to a nationwide audience, and has spoken in front of members of Congress to address a workplace culture that doesn't respect women. As a member of the LGBTQ community and a politically charged world, she believes that now, more than ever, people must speak up for what is right and has made it her mission to empower organizations committed to pushing us toward a more equitable world. So I want to first give people a little background on what Wethos is and why you started the company. Sure, yeah. So uh, Wethos is a platform built to connect people with more meaningful work. So we help freelancers find jobs based on what they care about in their skill sets, um, mainly within the nonprofit space, social conscious businesses, and progressive political campaigns, uh, as well as on the nonprofit side, you know, starting to solve this like massive resourcing problem that they have. And, and sort of like the core vision of the company is to say, you know, we believe that people solving our toughest problems deserve the best talent. And how do we get um, this massive freelance force more involved in things like criminal justice reform and civil rights and the environment um, and really tackling deep societal issues and helping these nonprofits communicate that well and do, do other things that um, unfortunately they're not really able to have on staff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I started the company born out of, like, to, what you said earlier, like, born out of advertising, I used to be an art director, um, so I used to shoot commercials and do a lot of social digital stuff for some big brands, and uh, I was freelancing on the side for nonprofits to sort of fill that void in my life um, mm -hmm. of doing, you know, work that really aligned with my values, and so yeah. that's how the idea was born, mm -hmm. um, and from there, uh, you know, we went on to raise $1.1 million in uh, funding last summer, mm -hmm. Um, but you know, the journey was <laughs> not easy and, mm -hmm. uh, there was a massive learning curve to it and, uh, you know, I'm still learning. Um, but I think some of the things that we did and some of the tactics we used to really put process and strategy around it, um, helped us kind of get to that next stage, uh, you know, within a year of quitting our jobs. Got it. So then what made you decide to fundraise? So it was interesting, like, you know, when we quit, we didn't, we didn't really go out with the intention to fundraise. We were mm -hmm. like, you know, we didn't subscribe to like the whole tech thing. And we just kind of were like, we're making this thing that we love and um, we're going to just try to make enough money to, you know, be able to sustain it. As I think a lot of people tend to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, think, you think that you're not going to fundraise and you're like, oh, you need money. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this takes way longer than we thought it was going to take. Yeah. Um, so, but it got to the point where, you know, we had scraped together like $20,000 of our own money and I had met this developer in a coffee shop and convinced him to build the first iteration of the product, the MVP. I Did you have to pay him? Um, no, actually. Uh, we ended up keeping him on and then, and then paying him, yeah, but okay. the, the first iteration he did, uh, he was very passionate about what we were doing and yeah. I, he actually saw me in the coffee shop, he saw over my shoulder uh, the designs, it was in Photoshop. Yeah. mocking up the first MVP, which by the way, at the time, like I didn't know what an MVP was. Yeah. Um, I was like, here's the whole product forever. Um, and he just saw it over my shoulder and he was like, that's really cool looking. Like, what is it? And then one thing sort of led to another. So he ended up building that for us. Um, and then we kept him on for a couple months afterwards to help like maintain it. 
but uh, we launched an MVP a month before the election. Mm. And once the election hit, it just blew up. We ended up with like a thousand freelancers and 200 nonprofits over the course of like two or sorry, three or four months. I think in that moment, people felt so helpless mm. and we were giving people and we continue to give people an outlet to really take action and to see the impact of what they can do and to use their skills to do so. Mm -hmm. So it goes a step beyond, you know, just donating or protesting. And it really feels like, Hey, you know, if I can get this website up for this nonprofit who's dealing with immigration then they can drive more donations and I can see the direct impact of what I've done. Nice. Um, and then on the other side, when the government tends to slash public funding, mm -hmm. The nonprofit sector sees a massive influx of, of cash from the public. Yeah. And that's sort of the action reaction of how we deal with things. And so the nonprofit space for decades has been saving us. Yeah. Like, you know, the ACLU is a nonprofit, Planned Parenthood is a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Like all of the activists that were on the red carpet during the Oscars are executive directors of nonprofits by day. Yeah. Trana Burke is the founder of the Me Too movement. She is an executive director of a small community nonprofit, which is how Me Too got started. Yeah. And so you sort of see this juxtaposition between, um, you know, what the government is doing and then how the nonprofit space tends to come in and, and pick up the pieces. Mm -hmm. And that's where, uh, you know, with all of this influx, um, you know, the ACLU like quadrupled its membership in the first quarter of 2017. Uh, Planned Parenthood saw an increase in donations of like 500%. Like it just was wild. And so with all of that, both sides of the market kind of seeing this explosion, um, it created like the perfect storm. And uh, so that's when the product broke. <laughs> and, I love that. I always I like to tell my co-founder who was our CTO, I was like, um, my goal is to break stuff. Yeah. And he's like, no, don't say that, I don't want to break it. I was like, but that's a good thing. That's I know. I'm aware of it. Like, and that's when things fell apart. And uh, no, and we really sat down and we were like, this is something that needs to scale. It's something that needs to reach a lot of people. And we know that on profit space is spending a lot of money trying to find resources and that mm. they can't keep people on staff full time often, but they can pay a developer for three months to help them with their website. Yeah. Um, and so that's when we decided like, okay, we're, we're going to do this thing. And that's when we started a fundraise. And I took my first meeting, my first angel investor meeting literally in November. Okay. So then <laughs> let's like backtrack. Mm -hmm. What was your process for you had no access, <laughs> no network, zero, literally zero network. Oh boy. I, I mean, and we were in my last company lucky enough to, with our collective background in terms of we went to University of Chicago, mm -hmm. my co-founder went to the business school, she had classmates who were, you know, people who had full-time jobs in finance. So yeah. you can access that network. You had zero. So one, what was the approach you took for an outsider coming in to it? Yeah, man, it's all, it's all network building. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no silver bullet to this, right? Like it's like working out. Like you can't go yeah. to the gym one day and run six miles and expect to be in shape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I started to try to understand like the world, that world in general, mm -hmm. finding tech events to go to meetups using, I used a ton, like a bed, right? Meet up a ton. Mm -hmm. And I just started showing up um, and starting to network my way kind of into things and meeting people. And like part of net what's hard about networking is figuring out like who's useless and who's useful mm -hmm. because a lot of Ooh, people, that's yeah, that's a lot so of people want to help, mm -hmm. but there are also red flags to watch out for. Wait, what are those? And so like a lot of, there are a lot of poachers out there who want to become advisors to startups. Yeah. And we got a lot of this and it was, it was interesting to me because, and actually a, an entrepreneur, um, who was like a bit of a mentor of mine actually, uh, said to me once, you know, when I'm looking for advisors, usually I have them work with me for at least three months before we put anything on paper, I make a decision. That's right. And he told me, this actually comes straight from him. He told me that like, if somebody approaches you and says like, I want to be an advisor and then is immediately trying to like negotiate equity or, you know, put something on paper, do something like that. Like, that's a red flag. Yeah. And as a first time entrepreneur, like you just don't, you're like, Oh my God, great. Somebody wants to help me. Like, and, and you're not sure like, you know, what your equity is even worth. Mm -hmm. And like, it's easy to kind of just dole out equity at, 
to get people to do things, and that can be a dangerous game to play. So this advisor should work for you. Yes, same with an advisor. And they, they should, should prove their value. They yeah. should prove their value before you decide. Like I'm gonna put this person in my deck or on my website or whatever else, um, mm-hmm. because some people are like leeches, frankly. Yeah. Uh, and so you know, parsing through a lot of that, parsing through like what's good advice and what's not good advice is difficult. Um, something actually a uh, VC just said to me a couple weeks ago was that she likes to collect opinions mm-hmm. and I think that I thought that was a very interesting way of putting it especially as you're parsing through advice and yeah. saying like hear people out collect opinions but then at the end of the day like trust your gut and yeah, make sort your through decision. it yeah. right like because a lot of this is like emotional whiplash and mm-hmm. you end like this person saying that raise raise this much no raise that much and like I hear that constantly from founders being like I don't know to raise and everybody's telling you something different yeah and it's all contact it's all experience everyone has varying experiences yeah too so like take it with a grain of salt like obviously right. use their expertise but then you know your company the best. yeah and like that's sort of the context too like yeah. where they're coming from are they a product person are they a business mm-hmm. person are they whatever like what have they invested in before yeah you have to like yeah. really just take those things into consideration before you act on any advice um and so anyways like so networking is a huge part of this literally like going to these events and as we as I started to go to more I started to realize like what were the good ones what were the bad ones what I found um that is sort of like pertains to this the strategy is events that happen either early in the morning or during the day tend to be a bit more um targeted because you know those are the people who don't have full-time jobs mm. and so like the breakfast events that I was going to I found were much more fruitful then maybe the after hours, happy hour type of thing. Because yeah. at the happy hour type of event, you're getting anybody who could have just left work and is just like, I'm interested in entrepreneur. And like, yeah. but if you're trying to meet specific types of people, then um, those two events can kind of be like a shit show. For yeah. Everybody. And you're just like, oh, you have no idea what you're going to get. You're really rolling the dice. And like time is very valuable. Yeah. So events during the day and events in the mornings tend to be a bit better. Mm-hmm. Um, there's We're a few, yeah. Breakfast with an yeah. investor is here in New York. Um, she, Bonnie does that event. I, I want to say once a month, but I'm not exactly sure, but those are really great. Bonnie's awesome. Yeah. She does. Um, the small ones are better. The more intimate the, the event, the better. Um, I had to learn that. Do, yeah. <laughs> round tables are great. Um, breakfast with investors is great. It's just contained and small, like mm-hmm. 15 to 20 people. You're gonna get much more value. Referrals. Out of that. Yeah, you're gonna get way more value out of that than like a sea yeah. of like things. And like we made this mistake a few times where we bought these expensive conference tickets, thinking we would go and network, whatever. But no, when you're looking at a thousand people at a conference, everyone's trying to talk. It's to yeah, and it's so hard to exercise that time properly. And so like yeah. the smaller events and the ones during the day tended to be better. Yeah. And so over time, um, I started to network, and then I started to Google like lists of New York City investors, who were the angel investors, who were the VCs, and I started cold emailing. Um, and there's no, like, again, like, I don't necessarily like, silver bullet to that. There's things that I did when I cold emailed well, and there's things that I didn't do well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, too, again, like, really understanding who you're emailing, like, BCCing does not work. Don't even, That's, I wouldn't even try it. <laughs> just be personalized. Like, yeah. Just, the way I look at it is, if you're asking someone for thousands of dollars, sometimes a million, millions of dollars, right. like you need to take the time to yeah. send them a well thought out and personalized yeah. email. It's you just like, just this is like a CRM funnel. On no, you're not inviting them to a dinner party. This is literally <laughs> money going into your bank account. Yeah, and with angels, it's like their money, like it's literally their, their money. personal money. Yeah. It's not coming from a fund, they're personal. So literally take the extra five minutes to personalize it, right. like that's super important. Google them, figure it out. So then, how did? Because I, you talked about this too on the panel, where even your process for emails. So you said you did these cold yeah. emails. One, what what did you do to decide who to? Was there a rhyme and reason, like who to contact? Like what was your thought process through that? So at first, definitely not. Like I was definitely throwing paint at the wall. Um, and that's okay. Yeah, you can do that really. right. That's fine. Because uh, sometimes you you meet people and. You use that tab. We use that tab yeah. to meet someone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. I, I was like truly throwing paint the wall. Um, just was like whoever I could, who would have coffee with me, I wanted mm-hmm. to meet with. Yeah. And uh, you know, but over time, you start to figure out like what are the types of investors that I should be talking to, um, and who might be interested in this. And I use different tactics as as I evolved in the process of like 
you know, if I'm looking up an investor and I look at their Twitter feed and it's all deep tech and there's nothing on that feed that even like mentions or thinks about social or political issues going on. Cause this is now, um, January 20th. This is now like he, Trump gets inaugurated, like shit is hitting the fan. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm on social media and I see that there's an investor and, and they're not commenting at all on what's going on, I already know this is probably not going to be a good fit yeah. for us because so much of this platform is activism. Mm -hmm. And so like that is a filter that like we use specifically through our company yeah. that is a little bit softer. It's not like, a, Oh, we want to target product people or finance people. It's more so like, it's very human, right? It's just like, are you going to give a shit about this? Yeah. And, gr and like, chances are, if you're not commenting on like the fall of our democracy, you're not going to care about this. Yeah. Um, it's true. And one yeah. of my favorite things that I was told early, early on when I was like in college starting my, my first couple companies is um, a mentor told me like investors invest in people, not ideas. Yeah. And so it's a great tactic to use when you are looking for potential investors to look at what are some of their interests. Cause it's kind of like dating to like totally. where you go to someone's profile and you're trying to figure out what are some similar interests. Like, yeah. Oh, like that's why people say, I like to take a walk in the park and bullshit like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. it's the same thing with the boat. It's like, what are their common interests? Are they going to want to get on board? Totally. And yeah. Things like, are they that. on the board of a nonprofit? Yeah. Like, do they have any, like, do they volunteer? Like, is there any, you know, like just, just those like little things helped create a filter over time. Yeah. And I started to learn like, I can be sitting with um, this product person and this product person who have similar backgrounds, similar expertise that I want or need. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the last filter left is like, do you give a shit? Right. Yeah. And so like this person might've been an amazing fit on paper, but then I sat down with them and it's just like not clicking or like they, they clearly just like, don't see the vision. They don't, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm getting questions like, uh, Oh, like, I guess I don't really understand like why people would want to freelance specifically on this platform. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, it's to, because they're connecting with work that is personal to them. Like the designer who maybe like grew up with an autistic sister is now working with an organization that deals with uh, mental disabilities. Mm -hmm. And like, if you can't understand why people want to connect that way, then like fundamentally you're not going to, I know you're not going to invest in this yeah. because that is the core Okay. premise right yeah and so a lot of it too is parsing through the questions you're getting the pushback you're getting like mm -hmm. if they're questioning the core premise of your company mm -hmm. you're wasting your time but what i saw and what i've seen is that if they get past the why within the first five minutes and they're like okay i get why people would want to do meaningful work then the conversation transitions into how and that's a much more exciting conversation to have because mm -hmm. then you're talking about here's what our sales cycle looks like and here's what we're going to do with the product, blah, blah, blah. And they're not questioning the whole time along the way to like, well, what's the point of this existing? Yeah. And like, that's a much um, stronger conversation to have than to spend the first 30 minute phone call explaining like, well, why would nonprofits need their own space? Yeah. And like spending the whole time defending that. Got it. Um, and so like, it's little things like that, like reading the conversation and understanding like, are the questions I'm getting around, like, how do you predict your sales cycle? Like, what are the tactics you're using? Or are they questions around, like, you know, I don't understand why people want this or need this. Then, like, it's really hard to get past that, I would say. So can you walk people through yeah. what, what, what were the steps you took sure. to understand the investor and also figuring out how other, what are some other ways I can get in front of them? Yeah. So Twitter has actually been an amazing tool for me. Twitter's great. I have to give up on Twitter. I'm not, I'm not giving up on Twitter, but it's work. <laughs> it is. No, it is. Twitter is like real work. Like yeah. it's, it's uh, great for founders though. Really good it, for them. It's very useful, but it's a time investment. Like yeah. you do have to do the time investment. And so I, I did a couple of different things. Um, the spreadsheet, what I found, like I said, it was like a, with a lot of these events, you are, you end up throwing paint at the wall. You don't know who's going to be there. You don't know what you're going to get out of it. And, and time is a valuable yep. asset. Um, and so much of this takes up so much time already that it's like, if you show up and then you get nothing out of it, it's like, it sucks. Yeah. So I, um, with like the cross section of like Eventbrite and meetup, um, following, uh, VCs on Twitter, looking at their blogs. A lot of them talk about like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to be here next. or I'm going to be doing this panel or I'm going to be whatever. And I don't mean like stalking them in coffee shops. Cause that's crazy. That's weird. <laughs> but if they are going to a public event, that is fair game. That's fair game. <laughs> that's fair game. That's your stalking. Panel. Like, you're, yeah. This is it's like, and the thing is like, this is their job. Their job mm -hmm. is to network. Their job is to create deal flow. 
you shouldn't feel weird or ashamed of like, you know, going to this panel and, and tracking them down, like getting what you want. Yeah. Like that's what you're there for. And I still, I still do this. Like, yeah. and I, I now have investors that like I could get, and I do get a lot of warm introductions, but some people don't respond to me. And I, uh, literally last month I tracked down an investor who wouldn't like, wouldn't respond to me. And, uh, even after a warm introduction and I showed up at an event and I just introduced myself. And I was like, hey, like, one of my best introduce her. I just want to put, like, a name to the face, like, shook her hand, whatever. And, like, two days later, she responded to my email. Mm. And, like, it, again, it's just, like, if you know that they're going to be somewhere, and especially if it's, like, a free event and it's, like, an hour of your morning, mm -hmm. sometimes it's worth tracking them down and, like, showing up. And so the, so doing that and, like, specifically understanding, like, okay, I want to meet, you know, Susan Line at BBG Ventures. Yeah. Let me check out our Twitter feed. Let me check out our blog. BBG's awesome. Whatever. Yeah. And she's awesome too. Um, you know, let me figure out like if she's going to be on panel soon or something. And then you start to kind of track them down and introduce yourself. And it's, that's always just like, if you can't get a warm instruction, you got to make one yourself. Ooh, and I love that. Yes. Right. And like, that's like the next step, right? Like, it's yeah. just like, what am I going to do? Like, I don't know. Nobody was going to introduce me. So uh, I got to go find these people. And I, mm -hmm. and I, then I have that. You get that minute and a half of FaceTime to just like stick, to be sticky. Yeah. And to just say like, hey, I'm doing this, blah, blah, blah. Like, I, I would love to chat sometime. Like, do, do you have an email? And that that's all, you in and out. Like, you don't want to, you don't want to target Don't people. take all their time. Yeah. yeah. There, there's yeah. a million people at these events, panels, whatever, trying to talk to this person. You want to take like less than a minute if possible. Just want to introduce yeah. yourself. Here's what I'm doing. I'd love to chat um, at some point if you don't mind. Like, do you have a card? Always get their card. You could give people your their email. Email. Yeah, they'll lose your email unless they, they unless someone yeah. needs something from like you. Yeah, you want to get you got. Yeah, email. the goal is get in, get the contact info, and get out, and yeah. then you do the rest. What are things that you did to when you did get in front of them or sent that email? Yeah, um, were able to then tie it back to one what you did, showing right. that you know mutual interest, but also showing that you actually took the time to figure out who they were, yeah. what they're about. I think a lot of it comes down to like doing the work for them and like showing them why so they should true. be interested in it, yeah. you know? And so like that, the first cold email I sent was to Adam Quinton, who's like one of the a big angel investor here, but, um, and I had, I was looking at his LinkedIn and his blog or whatever, and he'd written this blog about how he finds that women, um, it's not that women are risk averse. It's just that they are risk aware. Yeah. And went into this whole thing about how like, they're just less like blind to the risk. And so mm -hmm. women tend to understand the risk a bit better before making a decision yeah. rather than just being sort of like blind to it and like bulldozing through. Um, and it really resonated with me because I always felt that like I I'm very much that way. My team is very much that way. My co-founders, um, and our it's, companies are more profitable. I'm yeah, and it's just, more about like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's exactly. a good thing. And I think I think this is in large part part of that, where it's like women tend to tend to take it the extra couple of hours to understand the risk yeah. before taking it and making mm -hmm. that decision. And and it's about like identifying your unknowns and yeah. then like you know all this. so anyway, he wrote this post that really resonated with me. And so that was part of the email. I said, like, you know, I, uh, this blog post link really mm -hmm. resonated with me. Um, I have two female co-founders and we really, uh, you know, we really resent people saying like, like women are risk averse. And I think the way that you framed it just like really resonated. And uh, he responded and I got coffee with him. And that was the first um, investor meeting I ever had. Awesome. Um, and it was very, he, and, and from there, like he was just very helpful. Um, mm -hmm. he sat down with us for a, a, a bunch of meetings, went through our deck, helped us reformat it, whatever. He didn't write us a check, but building that relationship Help helped with others. more introductions yeah. and helped us. Um, one thing he told us that I still do today, which I tell other people is like, when you're titling the slides of your deck, the titles should tell the story mm -hmm. because the VCs are you know, for 30 seconds. And so if somebody's going to look at your deck and only see the title of your slide, what is the one thing you want them to take away from it? Yeah. So instead of saying like the problem, the solution, the market, you use that real estate to say like, um, nonprofits have a huge resourcing problem on their hands. Mm -hmm. And that way, like if nobody reads the rest of the slide, at least they're getting a full story. It's like you're the pitch. Yeah. It's, it's like, like the, the trailer. High level. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And so yeah. it's just like, 
Um, those, and then like the next slide is like a platform built for more meaningful work. Oh, I love and, that. And like, that's where, yeah. and so as soon as I sat down and, and told the story through the titles, mm-hmm. the, the deck came together in a much more cohesive way. And it also, that's amazing. it also showed me like where the holes in our story was, where yeah. I was like, okay, well this side following that side actually like doesn't really make sense in this story. Like how yeah. do we want to lay out this timeline and like explain our company? Um, and it's like things like that, like those little 30 minute hour long sessions that we had with Adam at the very beginning that stick and that made it just a little bit better the next time around, which oh, meeting gets yeah. a little bit better. Um, and so, yeah, it's doing that. And then like when you're walking up to somebody, um, like Susan line and saying like, uh, you know, Hey, I want to introduce myself. My name is Rachel. I'm doing this company. It's a platform built to connect more meaningful work. Um, I'd love to chat with you. I think your background at AOL and, uh, you know, with branding and with agency and like all these other things, um, would be really, uh, interesting here, Mm -hmm. especially as it pertains to like our freelancers and like their agency backgrounds and like how we're getting more people, whatever. And so it's just like, and then that's like 30 seconds. Um, that's stickier because she, I'm approaching her saying like, this is why I think you'd be interested. You're doing the work again. Yeah. You're doing the work for them. And then like, would you mind like could i grab your card and, and shoot you our deck yeah. you know um and and most of the time like they're gonna say yes um mm-hmm. they're gonna give you their email hopefully or their card and then you email them you send the deck over and then like worst case scenario is that like you don't get a response and like that's that whatever and then yeah. i would say like a good rule of thumb is like follow up um the following week uh and then follow up another maybe like week and a half let it go and then the, like two weeks at, the, at a certain point like i i do two maybe three follow-ups mm-hmm. if i really 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 want to talk to this person and if i'm getting rid of sounds like move on so did that episode get your life or did it get your life and the amazing thing that was only part one because rachel had so many amazing tips we had to make it a two-parter but in the meantime we would love to hear from you Both Rachel and I have raised capital from investors and are always looking at ways that we can help other female founders out. So let us know what questions you have about fundraising. Leave a comment below and let us know how we can help you.